It's crazy that most boat owners don't know which industry-changing hull innovations are built into their boat, or why they matter. The Deep V revolutionized offshore fishing in 1960, Carolina Flare changed deck space forever, and do you know what stepped hulls did for planing? Some breakthroughs cost manufacturers millions, while others were garage discoveries. However, here's what dealers won't tell you. Not every innovation works for every application, and some hyped hull features are making your boat worse for your actual boating. We're exposing the hull secrets manufacturers quietly argue about at boat shows, but never put in brochures. Let's start with something most boaters never think about, but feel on every trip. The boundary layer. As your hull moves through the water, a thin film of water sticks to the surface, creating an invisible blanket of drag that quietly steals speed and wastes fuel. How thick that boundary layer becomes depends on how smooth, sharp, and well-shaped your hull is. A poorly designed surface forces water to separate and swirl behind the boat, slowing it down and demanding far more power than most owners realize. Boat builders spend huge amounts of time shaping hulls to control this Layer, reducing friction, keeping flow attached longer, and preventing that swirling, energy-robbing drag that acts like you're towing a water-soaked parachute. If your hull isn't tuned to the way you actually use your boat, you're losing efficiency every minute you're underway. And this is exactly why the next major design choice, the V-Hull, became so important in modern pleasure boats. Let's break down why. On April 12, 1960, a wooden 31-footer named Moppy screamed into 30-knot winds and 6-foot seas for the Miami-Nassau race. While competitors got beaten to pieces, C. Raymond Hunt's radical new hull sliced through waves effortlessly. Moppy finished the brutal 185-mile race in 8 hours flat, while most boats limped in the next day. Hunt ran a constant 23.5 degree V-shaped dead rise from bow to transom, defying conventional wisdom. Dick Bertram immediately started production of the Bertram 31. The controversy? Hunt tried patenting the Deep V, but Skipper magazine had published his design in July 1958, making it public domain. Every builder copied it without paying Hunt a dime. True Deep V hulls with 21 to 24 degrees transom dead rise ride beautifully in rough water but roll like crazy when drifting. They burn more fuel than flatter hulls. Most builders now use modified V-hulls that flatten to 16 to 20 degrees aft, but marketing still calls them deep V because that's what sells. Modified V-hulls vary dead rise from bow to stern, typically starting at 50 degrees forward and tapering to 16 to 20 degrees at the transom. Sharp forward sections slice waves while flatter aft sections provide speed and stability. Bass boats use steep forward dead rise but only 10 to 12 degrees aft for quick planing. Offshore boats keep more dead rise aft for better ride quality. The dirty secret. Many builders exaggerate dead rise numbers in marketing. They quote the bow angle but omit the transom measurement where it actually matters. Some give you a single average dead rise number that's meaningless. Demand the transom dead rise number. That determines whether your boat pounds or rides smooth, and it's what dealers conveniently forget when closing sales. Pads are flattened 6 to 10 inch sections along the center line that reduce wetted surface at speed. They work great in smooth water, adding 3 to 5 miles per hour. But when running on the pad, you're balancing on a narrow strip. Hit rough water wrong, and you'll fall off, causing violent rocking. Pads excel in flat water, but make boats lose in following seas. Stepped hulls introduce air under the boat through notches molded across the bottom. Aerated water creates less drag than solid water. The concept dates to WW1 hydroplanes, but fell out of favor due to bow stuffing. Modern designs from Michael Peters solved most issues. Invincible stepped V ventilated tunnel even won Navy adoption. The catch? Steps work best at higher speeds with consistent airflow. At lower speeds, ventilation causes wandering. Buy from builders refining the design for years, not trend jumpers. Ventilated tunnels capture air between sponsons, creating aerodynamic lift that supports boat weight and reduces drag. Moving through air creates 800 times less drag than water, so this is basically free horsepower. 
Forward motion compresses air in the tunnel, creating a high-pressure cushion. Sponsons act as wing end plates, making airflow dramatically more efficient. Research shows properly designed ventilated tunnels reduce resistance up to 30% at high speeds. That translates to higher top speeds or better fuel economy, depending on how you use the extra efficiency. The catch? These hulls are extremely sensitive to design parameters. Tunnel width, sponson shape, entry angle, and deck height all interact complexly. Get it wrong and you make the boat worse. This is why you see ventilated tunnels from specialized firms like Morelli and Melvin, not from every builder with a mold. Carolina Flare is that aggressive outward bow curve designed for brutal conditions off the outer banks, where Gulf Stream meets shallow banks. The concept? Fine entry angle drives into waves, and as waves grow, flare rises over them, throwing water back to sea instead of onto deck. Builders like Buddy Davis and Regulator perfected this through generations. Chines or lifting strakes carried well forward push water aside and provide buoyancy. At 30 knots in 6-foot seas, that flare keeps you dry and prevents bow stuffing. The trade-off? Pronounced flare creates less forward cabin volume because hull sides angle outward. Carolina builders chose seaworthiness over sleeping berths every time. The other downside, as flare gradually immerses, it causes vertical acceleration, making the boat pitch. This burns more fuel, but 40 miles offshore when wind pipes up, you'll take that trade gladly. Axe bows take the opposite approach with nearly vertical stems from keel to deck. The secret is below the waterline, where the forefoot extends deeper, creating longer, finer entry that slices through waves with minimal resistance. The shear line stays raised to keep green water off deck. Darman Shipyards and Delft University developed this by lengthening the bow without adding weight forward, creating a huge moment arm that dampens pitch accelerations by up to 50% compared to flared bows. This means less crew fatigue, lower structural loads, and 20% fuel savings. Why you don't see them on fishing boats? They can be wet. Without aggressive flare throwing spray aside, more water comes over the bow. They also require more rudder input in steep waves. For commercial and military applications, trade-offs are worth it. For recreational boaters, different calculus. Catamaran sponsons and the tunnel between them create aerodynamic lift like an aircraft wing. The underside of that deck and tunnel form an airfoil that accelerates air and creates pressure differentials. Sponsons act as end plates, containing airflow and maximizing pressure differential. The challenge? If the boat becomes airborne and loses water contact, pitch moment becomes unbalanced because aerodynamic center is typically above center of gravity. This causes pitch over, which happened in high-profile racing incidents. Modern catamarans address this with carefully designed sponsor bottoms maintaining hydrodynamic control. The tunnel also manages spray, what builders call sneeze catchment. When sponsons knife through water at speed, they throw spray inward. Poorly designed catamarans let spray create massive turbulence and drag. Well-designed tunnels guide spray through and out the back cleanly. The difference can be 3 to 5 miles per hour on the same hull and power. Trim tabs are hinged plates mounted on the transom that deflect water downward, creating lift that adjusts running attitude. Interceptors are vertical blades that drop from the transom doing essentially the same thing. The controversy, are these essential tools or expensive band-aids covering up poor hull design? The tab camp argues they're critical for fine-tuning any hull to different loads and conditions. They can improve fuel economy 5 to 15 percent. The interceptor crowd claims their system is superior, faster acting, no drag when retracted, uh, more responsive. But here's the uncomfortable question. If the hull was designed properly, would you even need these? Critics argue tabs and interceptors fundamentally compensate for design compromises. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Some boats genuinely benefit from trim control, others are hiding design flaws behind hydraulic patches. Chines are where boat bottom meets side, either hard, sharp corner, or soft, rounded. Hard chines create definite breaks where water separates from the hull reducing wetted surface and throwing spray outward. 
They make boats feel more responsive, but can be twitchy. Soft shines flow smoother, creating softer ride but letting more spray up hull sides. Strakes are longitudinal ridges generating controlled turbulence that creates lift and stability. Forward strakes direct water away from the bow, reducing pounding. Aft strakes create lifting force, helping boats plane and provide roll stability. The dirty secret? Many strakes on modern boats are decorative, not functional. Genuinely well-designed hulls might have three to four functional strakes per side. Committee-designed hulls might have six decorative ones that look cool but do nothing hydrodynamically. Spray rails are small horizontal ridges along hull sides that deflect water before it becomes deck spray. They only work within specific speed ranges and sea conditions. At low speeds, water doesn't climb hull sides. At very high speeds in smooth water, boats ride too high for rails to matter. They're most effective at intermediate speeds in chop. Many spray rails on modern boats are positioned wrong. The rail needs specific height relative to dynamic waterline at cruising speed. Too high, water never hits it. Too low, it's just underwater drag. The angle also matters. Properly designed rails angle outward and down to redirect water. Poorly designed ones stick straight out like shelves, catching water and making problems worse. You see bulbous bows on cargo ships, but almost never on recreational boats. That teardrop-shaped protrusion below the waterline creates its own bow wave that interferes with the main bow wave, partially cancelling it out. This wave cancellation can reduce resistance by 10-15% to at specific speeds. Here's why recreational boats don't use them. Bulbous bows only work efficiently within a narrow speed range tied to hull displacement and length. They're optimized for ships operating at constant displacement speeds. Recreational boats operate across wide speed ranges from trolling at 5 knots to running at 40 knots. A bulb optimized for 25 knots would create extra drag at 5 knots and be irrelevant at 40 knots when you're on plane. There's also the practical issue of draft. That bulb hangs down below the keel, increasing your draft by a foot or more. Not ideal when accessing shallow fishing grounds. Lifting pads at the transom create high-pressure zones, helping boats plane faster, especially useful on heavy boats with big outboards. They also maintain planing at lower throttle settings, improving fuel economy. Jupiter boats, Posi Stern is a 30-year success story. Notched transoms have cutouts in corners allowing water to flow out cleanly instead of creating turbulence. This reduces drag and prevents stern squat. They can pick up 2 to 3 miles per hour, but make boats more sensitive to trim and loading. Reverse transoms angle back under the boat, creating more cockpit space and waterline length. The catch? That low transom becomes a scoop in following seas. The overhanging load concentrates thousands of pounds on a cantilevered structure. Good builders use massive internal stringers. Sketchy builders hope for the best. Shallow water tunnels are cut into hull bottoms, creating space for propellers to sit higher while getting bite. This allows running in 12 to 18 inches, where conventional hulls drag bottom. They plane at lower speeds with less power, but ride rough in chop because that tunnel gives you a flat section that skips from wave to wave. Honest self-assessment matters. If you're genuinely spending most time in water less than 3 feet deep, tunnel hulls make sense. If you're occasionally visiting shallow water, but mostly boating deeper, that tunnel becomes a liability, making 80% of your boating less enjoyable. To enable 20% of special situations. Too many boaters buy tunnel hulls thinking they need them when a standard hull would serve them better. Cathedral hulls, also called tri-hulls, dominated the recreational boat market in the 1960s and 70s before almost completely disappearing. The design features three distinct planing surfaces. A center V-hull flanked by two sponsons, creating a distinctive M-shaped cross-section. The sponsons provide exceptional stability at rest, making these boats feel rock-solid when fishing or loading gear. That stability made them incredibly popular with families who wanted boats that didn't roll when kids were moving about. Ray Hunt developed the cathedral hull concept in the late 1950s, around the same time as the Deep V. The Boston Whaler 13 used a modified cathedral design with foam flotation, becoming one of the most successful small boats ever built. Manufacturers loved cathedral hulls because that wide, stable platform meant bigger cabins and spacious layouts on shorter hulls. The boats also got on plane easily with less horsepower. So why did they nearly vanish? 
because that same stability that made them great at rest made them pound like hell in rough water. Those flat sponsons slap hard in chop, transmitting every impact directly to your spine. As outboard horsepower increased and people started running farther offshore, the ride quality became unacceptable. By the 1990s, almost every manufacturer had abandoned cathedral hulls in favor of modified V-designs. The industry learned that what works straight out of the dock doesn't always work offshore. If you want to see how these hull choices affect real-world fuel consumption and operating costs, Check out our video, Hull Physics Secrets Every Owner Should Know. You'll be glad you did. The real innovation in modern hull design isn't any single feature. It's the computational fluid dynamics and tank testing, letting designers predict how multiple innovations interact before building a single boat. That separates serious builders from trend copiers.